later would Constantine take the decisive step of bestowing imperial patronage on Christianity. Before he did, he reconciled it still further with the customs and practice of imperial sun worship. He transferred the Christian holy day from the Sabbath to Sunday. And he moved Jesus' birthday to December the 25th, the festival of the rebirth of the sun. The Catholic Church willingly accepted these refinements and even made the transition easier by depicting all Christian saints with a halo, the symbol of the divine sun. In return, Constantine subsidized the church, bestowed palaces on its leaders, and appointed bishops to positions of power throughout his empire. But within a few years, his plan for religious harmony came under threat. Supreme Sovereign, you can hear the disunity which exists among the bishops. The Arians, I'm afraid, have built up private animosities which they won't give up easily. A theological argument about Jesus had erupted into one of Christianity's most bitter disputes. For nearly two centuries, Christians had believed Jesus was the divine Son of God. But now they realized this created a dilemma. How could Jesus' divinity be squared with the crucial idea of the one absolute and indivisible God? Were there two gods? With Christian bishops now wielding real power, Constantine was quick to see that the dispute could split his empire. In 325 AD, he summoned to his palace at Nicaea every Christian bishop and elder. One group of bishops tried to resolve the dilemma by minimizing Jesus' divinity, arguing that he had come into existence after God the Father. They were known as the Arians after their charismatic preacher, Arius. To the rest of the bishops, this smacked of heresy. It made the Son inferior to the Father and so denied Jesus' full divinity. Their advocates included Bishop Alexander from Egypt. Feelings ran high. The outcome would have been hard to predict. Consequently, there must have been a time before his creation when he was not. Heretic! Then, pagan enemies, we would have two gods. God was not always the father, once he was not. Supreme Sovereign, the Emperor Constantine, and the Empress Helena! It's strange that someone like Constantine should preside over the first ecumenical council. Not long before, he had supervised the murder of his wife and his son. But whatever Constantine's Christian and theological shortcomings, he was a supreme manager of men. And he knew what would be required to re-establish unity. A short compromise formula on which all could agree. My friends, it has long been my supreme desire to see you come together. He hoped that it would emerge naturally from the meeting. And now, my friends, without any more delay, and under the guidance of Almighty God, let us proceed with the discussions. But after several weeks, Constantine lost his patience and imposed his own compromise. It was put to the vote. Those who do not give their adhesion to this sound doctrine will be banished to the most remote regions. Supreme Sovereign, Fellow ministers, this is the creed to which we have unanimously declared ourselves signatories. We believe in one God, 
the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things came into being, things in heaven and things on earth, and because of us men and because of our salvation. Came down and become incarnate, becoming man. Suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven. And will come again to judge the living and the dead. What's that we've just been reading? Julian. Um. It's the earliest statement of our faith, Father. That's right, Gillian. It's the Nicene Creed. It's the earliest complete statement of our faith. It would be several centuries before the idea of Jesus as God incarnate would again become the subject of historical scrutiny. What happened when it did has been the subject of this series. There's now little doubt that a remarkable Jew called Jesus did live in first century Palestine. He was a man who, like other charismatic figures of the period, healed, exorcised, and preached to the outcast. He was not the Messiah most of his compatriots were expecting, but he may have sought to change those expectations. There's no evidence that he was ever seen as God in his lifetime. Or that he ever intended to found a new church. A church that bears his name has emerged from the beliefs of those who came after him. They combined the words of Jesus as handed down with elements of Judaism and paganism to form a religion of enduring and universal appeal. How much it is based on historical reality remains open to question. How much that matters remains a question for faith.